Hey, buddy, can you hear me? Sure can. All right, all right, all right. Um, wait, 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 wait. I'm doing my vocal warm up exercises over here. Make Are sure you I'm, really? I'm doing um, Unique New York from Anchorman. Yeah. Doing that one a lot. <laughs> Making sure we're all ready to go here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I really can. Okay. Um, he has entered the waiting room. Um, so I will just pipe him in and we'll get going here if you're if you're good with that. I am super duper good with that. Yeah. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Make sure we are recording. We are recording. All right. Father Michael, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks okay, to the miracle. Right. Thanks, thanks well, to the miracle you, of Zoom. Yes, well, it's amazing, isn't it? It has its um, limitations. I'm bound to say, but but it does do things. If, I see you've got grandmother and very prominently in the back. <laughs> he's um, he's good again. The daily office has been published, so we, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like him or not, he's part of the patrimony. You know what I mean? Yeah, so well, that's right. Well, there are. It's like a curate's egg, isn't it? I mean, there are lots of things to like and some not to like. Sure, exactly. sure. Um, <laughs> well, Father Michael, we want to thank you so much for being with us here today. This is really a privilege Pleasure. to have you on. Yeah. Um, my name is Ryan Pollock. We've been talking a little bit um, on email here, but it's great to finally yeah. see, see you face to face. Yeah. We, uh, Tim and I work with lossandgain.org and yeah. it's a simple yeah. little startup. We've been in business as it were for just a couple of months. And right. part of our aim is just, just to get together groups of former Anglicans and help yeah. others learn more about the Catholic Church. So we've seen right. you on a couple of different interviews now in various uh, places here and there. But um, I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that you are far above our station, and we're just very happy to have. I mean, oh, I was watching oh, no, the, no, no, the, the Nigel Farage yeah. interview earlier. But uh, <laughs> one one thing that yeah. we haven't one thing that we have in common with you, um, yeah, among the many things I'm sure, is that we were former Anglican priests ourselves. So yeah. I was a priest. Where were in, you? Where were you? Yes, I I was in the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, Texas. Right, right, yes. Oh, yeah, with, with um, James, Bishop James. Uh, uh, yeah, Bishop Stanton, that's right, that's right. And then yeah, uh, yeah. George George Sumner most recently. Yes, yes, well, I knew them both, knew, know them both very well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. I was in the Diocese of North Carolina. Um, uh, right. With, uh, you know, the guy who oversaw my uh, discernment process was uh, Michael Curry, so... He, oh, of course, went on to, to bigger and better yeah, things soon thereafter. Yeah. They well, saw yeah, how I'm well sure. he handled me, and they were like, you know, get this guy the top job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we're just, we're just so delighted to talk to you uh, today, Father Michael. Uh, for our folks watching this at, at home who, who probably don't know, I mean, I'm sure if you've made it to this channel, you, you know who Father Michael is, but he's the former Bishop of Rochester, and... Um, but before that, you, you're not from Rochester originally. You are from Pakistan. Is that right? That's right. Yes, I was a bishop there before I was bishop of Rochester. And you grew up in a, in a, in a Muslim home. That's right. Yes, I come from a large Shia family. And it um, was my father who was baptized. He was the only one in the family, which still remains largely Shia, Shia Muslim. Um, yes, yeah, so we grew up in a, this rather mixed economy of um, a large Muslim family with my father as a Christian, yeah. Yeah, and attended Catholic schools uh, yes. all the way through university, right? That's right, yes, from the very beginning. And um, I thank God daily for, for those schools. I mean, not so much for... Um, uh, directly what they taught me about religion but every other subject as well so 
it was an excellent education in, in every way. Yeah, I think that, that leads to maybe my first question, you know, as I was trying to familiarize myself with your story, uh, was, you know, the, the large Muslim influence and then Catholic education, but deciding to become Anglican. So I guess I'm, I'm yeah. curious about how that went. Yeah. Yes, well, um, um, at university, I came uh, under the influence, as did many other people, of an Anglican chaplain who had got onto the campus because even then, religious leaders were uh, prohibited from coming onto the campus uh, at the university. Uh, and um, that was not anti Christian in any way, that was even then to prevent extremist Islamists from coming on. Indeed, yeah. So you may ask, well, how did he get on? And the answer is he registered as a postgraduate student. But uh, <laughs> he's, he's got way. Jesuitical tricks, it yeah, sounds yeah, like, yeah. you know. There's always a way. There's always, yeah, well, the Jesuits, of course, lead the way in this, uh, in China and in India and so many places. But um, yeah, uh, he was very innovative. Uh, he brought us to a lively faith in Christ. Uh, he um, built it up. Uh, I mean, you know, if there was a Christian cricketing sportsman passing through, he would grab him to come and speak to us. And uh, there would be clubs and music and all sorts of things. So that gave me a model for ministry, which I think is valuable. It's a valuable model. And um, my encounter with Anglicanism suggested that here was a good way of being Catholic without being Roman Catholic. I think um, right. many people have thought that. And um, um, this chaplain also gave me a sense of being evangelical, which I wanted to be and still want to be, along with people like George Weigel. I mean, years ago, I was asked by a British newspaper to describe myself, and I said Catholic and evangelical, and Catholic in the sense that I wanted to be um, in connection with the church throughout the ages and across the world, and evangelical in the sense of wanting to share the good news of Jesus Christ with people. So anyway, so that was how it came to be. You, uh, you said your father had been baptized before. Uh, was he uh, was he a practicing Anglican by the time you got to college and met this Anglican priest, or how how did that how did yeah. those seeds start to be planted for you? Yeah, he was always practicing. He was baptized in a very Anglo-Catholic church. This was before partition, and he was a civil servant in Delhi. I mean, this is before I was born, so I'm really this is hearsay, uh, but because um, obviously I wasn't a witness to it, but. Um, uh, called St. James's Kashmiri Gate in Delhi, which was actually uh, an interesting uh, church building because it was built by a Muslim noblewoman who had been healed as a result of a vision of Jesus. As far as we know, she never openly became a Christian, but she built this church. So he was baptized there, uh, but... Um, he, I think it's fair to say he never really understood Christian divisions and um, went, you know, wherever inspiration would take him. Um, and to some extent, so did I. I mean, I, I remember going to the Baptist for good revivalist um, hymns and to the Anglican Church for liturgy and to the Methodists because they had a very good choir and, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> So yeah. Uh, pivoting slightly, uh, you a lot of your work has to do with uh, issues of of life and stuff like that. You know, whether it be abortion or or IVF or what have you. Um, yeah. And you were at the first March for Life in London, and it it has been said that garbage was thrown on you. Uh, yes, <laughs> that is true. Yes, I ruined my suit. I mean, comprehensively. Uh, uh, so I guess my my question is, uh, how did how did that reception compare to the public reception of your conversion <laughs> to Catholicism? Yes, well, actually, the the 
the the press coverage, the media coverage has been very positive. I was surprised. I was expecting a lot more brickbats than there have been, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some, uh, mainly from an extreme conservative evangelical sort of side, where I think they simply haven't caught up with history. So they're asking questions about justification by faith alone. Well, uh, <laughs> the Catholic Church is now uh, one of the great upholders of the doctrine of justification by faith, right. but they haven't caught up with these things. Um, and um, they haven't read Verbum Dei, but these are things that one has to explain to people, of course. Yeah, uh, my, it, this isn't super relevant, but my friends are, my friends, my parents uh, are in the continuing Anglican church and you've, you've had a lot to do with that in the United States. Uh, and just Googling around, I saw that Felix Orgy, whom they know, uh, was maybe not super pleased about your yeah. conversion. And so yeah. I, um, in keeping with the loss and gain theme, which you know is, is Newman's novel, and maybe we'll ask you soon if you've read that, uh, you know, there, there are some costs to conversion. Um, and yeah, so wondering sort of like, it, what what has been uh or have the difficulties of conversion been about what you expected or have they been better or worse you know hmm. well they're still unfolding i i'm not using the term conversion i mean i'm using the term fulfillment because even in his homily at the ordination cardinal nichols said that this is the fulfillment of a long priestly ministry and i think that is right and of course the prayer at the ordination also says that. Um, however, um, yes, I think there is a price to pay. I've been asked, for instance, to vacate the office space that I've been using and the secretarial help that has been provided um, because of it. So I'm looking for a, another place for an office. Um, some people have um, cut off communication. Uh, but on the whole, I think there's been sympathy. I think it's partly because Anglicans themselves see that their church is in a crisis and that different people are finding different solutions for that. Um, I respect other solutions that people are finding. But there is no doubt about a crisis and that a solution has to be, has to be found. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I think really of Newman's sermon, The Parting of Friends. Um, and I think it is that, unfortunately, with some people, uh, in one or two cases, the least expected people whom I had informed well in advance of what I was thinking, but when it actually happened, I mean, when I told them at first, they were supportive and said, yes, you know, one person even said, well, take me along with you. But when it actually happened, um, they were more um, reserved or hostile. Okay. So you talk about the, uh, uh, we, we've heard you talk a couple of times in various interviews about um, sort of on the ground pragmatic reasons for why things like the Anglican Roman Catholic dialogue has has failed or been, uh, I think you said sabotaged uh, by Anglicans who continued to, uh, I guess, unmake those propositions. But um, I wonder then if, if how would you would how would you respond to a criticism of somebody who would say something like, um, yeah, but but the, but the Church of Rome is not too far away from doing these very same sorts of. Uh, you have a synod on synodality coming up soon. What's that all about? Uh, I, I wonder if there's something beyond a, a pragmatic reason that we could give to somebody who was responding in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think the Church of Rome is anywhere near what is being said. Um, I mean, every church should have discussion, of course, within its life about what is happening around it. And I'm certainly not against that. Um, well, let me uh, let me say a few things. 
I think the first is that when uh, a decision is made that affects everyone, uh, a church must have the capacity to make it stick. And the Anglican communion has been found woefully wanting in doing that. So I've been present at decisions made together by an overwhelming majority. And then people have gone home and done just whatever they liked. Uh, those of you who have experience in the Episcopal Church know very well the kind of thing I'm talking about, but it is still going on. Secondly, I think you need a clear body of teaching over a whole number of things. I mean, uh, life issues were just mentioned by Tim. Um, uh, marriage and family is another one. Uh, religious freedom is another one. The, the relation between the word of God and tradition is another one. I mean, there are so many you could enumerate. Mary and the saints. Um, uh, but you need a body of teaching to which you can appeal. Uh, I've just written an article for Faith magazine on uh, the observance of Sunday, because the obligation is still suspended here. I am not sure about the US. Uh, but, you know, what is the importance of meeting on a Sunday and what is the importance of um, receiving? the Blessed Sacrament on a Sunday and that kind of thing. So I, when I, while I was doing that, I consulted the Catholic Catechism, of course. Um, uh, I definitely did that in my ministry all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, what did they well, say? Oh, well, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, well, again, yeah, so did I. So, um, so I think a body of teaching. And then thirdly and crucially, uh, that there should be a proper authority that can from time to time, not promiscuously, not all the time, but from time to time say to the faithful, that is the way to go, not this one. Uh, and Anglicanism conspicuously lacks it and actually disowns the possibility, I think more seriously. Um, although some sensible Anglicans um, do see the need for it. I mean, Robert Runcy, with whom I worked, uh, in the past, used to say, there is only one universal primate. Don't try and turn the Archbishop of Canterbury into a universal primate. But then if there is a universal primate, then we have some obligation to relate to him, right. uh, just as he does to us. Um, I mean, you know, I'm a kind of Utunum Sint papist, if you like. Um, yeah, uh, then finally on this, um, I think Newman is very important in terms of the development of doctrine. Uh, that um, I, well, um, uh, sola scriptura sounds good, and uh, the Bible is, of course, um, the, um, as Pope John Paul II said, the highest source of authority, supreme rule of faith. But um, uh, how do we relate the Bible to new knowledge? It's the same with the Orthodox. I admire the Orthodox um, insistence on tradition. But the question is how we relate that tradition to what is going on around us, to new knowledge. And I think Newman gives us a principled way of doing this, which the other churches uh, do not have, um, and it, it has given Catholicism a way of relating to new knowledge, which I think is uh, going to be very important. Yeah, it's no, it's no surprise, I think, that you know Newman's arm has grown so long because uh, he he really ident like puts his finger right on modern issues. You know, they were. Yeah. They're the same things he was dealing with as are what we're dealing with now. Um, and he gives, yeah, I think basically the right solutions. Uh, if, if I can refer to something you said right before that final answer uh, about the Archbishopric of Canterbury, um, I understand that you were sort of in the running alongside Rowan Williams, um, you know, back in the day. Uh, so if I can ask you to imagine an alternate universe where where you, you know, 
ascend to the, the throne of St. Augustine, uh, how do you bring the Church of England and Rome back together? Yeah, no, I, ca I can't comment on it. I mean, I think if you want to see comment on it, then Rowan himself has given an interview to The Telegraph last week um, in which he discusses this issue, but it's not for me to discuss it. However, um, I think the problem, you know, whoever it is, the problem remains that um, as the, the present Archbishop of Canterbury said recently, when he was asked uh, this question, he said, well, we make decisions by consensus. And even then people uh, need to own that decision or not to, or, or not to own it. Well, I mean, that's not going to work. And um, it will cause um, incoherence and indeed chaos as it has done in the Anglican Communion. So um, the, the provision of a universal primate to exercise his office uh, prudentially uh, and providentially is a necessity, I think, for the church. Um, I can. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. But, I mean, going back to the um, uh, to the relationships between uh, the Anglican Communion and Rome. I mean, we worked oh, by we. I mean, all of those who have been members of our kick worked very hard um, on producing agreements. The mandate was to produce agreements that would restore communion between the two churches. I mean, that was the mandate. It was not kissy kissy ecumenism. Uh, it was not uh, just about friendly dialogue about how we could work together on practical things and so on. It was about the restoration of uh, sacramental communion between the two churches. And we were told what the issues were that divided the two communions and we worked on them one after another and agreements were produced or in some cases convergence. Uh, but then the actions of churches within the Anglican communion showed that these, commu these agreements were not um, uh, were not sound, um, you know, even where Anglican said that it, uh, that the agreement reflected the faith of, of Anglicans was, was consonant the 1988 Lambeth Conference with which I had a lot to do, that it was consonant with the faith of Anglicans. Um, but then, uh, yeah, I mean, undermined, I think perhaps is a better word to use, but, um, the actions of Anglican churches without discipline undermine those agreements. Um, and, you know, I still pray for, and as I've said publicly, that the Church of England will return indeed to the faith of St. Augustine and to his mission. Um, no point having a throne if you don't have the faith. <laughs> yeah. Father Michael, much has been made in the news of you not belonging to any sort of Anglo-Catholic party and how surprised everyone is that a self-styled evangelical is making this move. At least that's the sort of uh, buzz that we've heard around lately. But uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on what's, from, from your perspective, what specifically started to lure you in, draw you in to consider um, Roman Catholicism as a, as a live option for you? Um, or, and or, cracks in the Anglican foundation that made you look over next door and say, hmm, I wonder what I'm missing here. Like, what were the first stepping stones, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, self-styled, even, I, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, when did I self-style myself that, uh, you know, that's, they are styling me like that, not me. Uh -huh, as, as I, I was, see. Yeah, yeah. As I was, yeah, I, I mean, it's easy to say he's self-styling, but it's actually other people who are pinning these things. Hmm. I mean, I have refused labels always, but when I was pinned down, as it were, I did say Catholic and evangelical in the sense that I would still use, I think, um, along with people like George Weigel, um, Catholic and evangelical or Catholic evangelical or however you want to put it or evangelical Catholic. 
that's probably best. However, uh, as I was saying, uh, from the very beginning, my attraction had to do, yes, certainly with mission and evangelistic ministry, but also with a way of being Catholic. I think, I, you know, I thought Anglicanism offered a way of being Catholic. Um, certainly, um, um, in any kind of division, then there has to be room for further unity. And I didn't think that Anglicanism had everything, but I did think that it had many things um, which impelled it towards greater Catholicity. It also has, I now recognize, many things that lead it in the opposite direction. Um, so, yes, I think I... I have said what the three things are that uh, what affects everyone uh, should be implemented so that it is implemented everywhere. That a body of teaching is needed to which the faithful and the clergy can appeal and that you need an authoritative magisterium that intervenes not to change the faith of the church, but to define it and clarify it, articulate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we talk with a lot of folks who we might charitably call uh, wishful thinking Anglicans, uh, folks who are really influenced by the work of theologians like F.M. Radner, Stanley Hauerwas, folks like that who say, um, you know, we have to take the long view with this. The Church uh, of England has seen herself in um, many and manifold troubling situations before. Uh, we have to be a part of a faithful remnant of sorts who endures through the Babylonian captivity and comes back and gets to rebuild uh, the temple in a new sort of orthodox traditional fashion. Um, what would you say to somebody who says, yes, I understand all the problems with Anglicanism, but this is a distinct way of being Catholic, but not Roman, and I have to hold on and endure until... Uh, things get better. What, uh, we, we talk to folks like that all the time. I wonder how you might counsel somebody in that position. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's never nothing. You know, it's, these are Pope Benedict's words, by the way. It's never nothing. So, of course, um, wherever there are elements of holiness and truth, um, there um, Christ is present, and where Christ is present, the church is present. I don't... Um, deny that. Um, but um, it's wounded and it's um, out of contact with the very things that can give it life um, and unity. And um, uh, I don't think that the direction of that the Anglican communion is taking at the moment is going to result in an orthodox revival. I think it is leading to a liberal Protestantism. Um, and um, if people make another sort of judgment, well, um, they can do so, of course, but the evidence is there for everyone to see. I mean, take the Episcopal Church. Um, 30 years ago, there were enough bishops uh, in the Episcopal Church who had this um, kind of orthodox Catholic evangelical commitment, and they belonged to something called the Irenaeus Fellowship. And I attended their meetings from time to time. Well, that simply doesn't exist now and could not exist. Um, similarly, in the Church of England, um, the bishops you could who stand in the great tradition, let's put it like that. Um, you can count on the fingers of one hand. This was not the case 30 years ago. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's willful in a way to say, you know, nothing has changed, we can carry on, uh, we can recover. Uh, well, I pray that we do, but we also have to look at the evidence of our own eyes. What I think we do need is uh, for Rome 
to accept the great diversity that there is in the Catholic Church um, and uh, the recognition of the ordinariates in the West, as it were, is, a, is the beginning of recognizing diversity also in the West. I mean, the West is becoming diverse in other ways because the Eastern rites are coming to the West and are quite populous. I mean, in Britain, for instance, just in very recent years, the Sarah Malabar rite from India uh, for reasons of um, immigration because of the medical profession and so on, that, that has become a substantial Catholic presence and they now have their own bishop here in Britain. Well, in the US, you have much more uh, diversity like that. I've met the Maronites in the US and so on. But I think um, what we need to reassure our um, friends um, of the Latin usage is that diversity is not a threat, but it's actually an enrichment or can be an enrichment for the whole church. The ordinariate, I think, has a mission in this. And um, having criticized some of the lacks in Anglicanism, there are also riches in Anglicanism uh, that need to be shared and um, um, are worth sharing. So yeah, that is the kind of thing I would say. Uh, it's a two-way thing. I mean, um, the movement towards greater Catholicity, but then the Catholic Church also has to provide wriggle room for those who are coming. Um, that was great, by the way. Uh, so one of the questions that I guess I'm surprised I haven't heard asked, and so sorry if this has been you know, ground covered in previous interviews, is like, uh, what is the best part of being Catholic now? And I know, you know, you don't have a lot of, lot of time under your belt. Um, but and I'm particularly curious because of what you said earlier about how you, you don't even think of it as conversion, but fulfillment. And so, you know, whether it's in your private devotions or your, your priestly ministry, you know, how are you, what sort of is most exciting about being Catholic now? Yeah, I think the universality and the uh, standing in the great tradition in a way that is authenticated by a teaching authority so that you're not just making things up all the time. Uh, I think that's the, that's the temptation in Anglicanism is to make up things um, <clears throat> if you can't find them anywhere else. But here there is a guarantee that you are actually standing in the great tradition. There is a guarantee of sacramental um, effectiveness, of sacramental assurance. Um, there is a guarantee of the continuity of apostolic ministry, uh, which is not, not master of the word, but it's servant. But nevertheless, uh, it is the agent by which the word of God is communicated in, in our world. I mean, all of those things I think I find valuable. Well, this past Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent, of course. And um, mm. sitting, sitting there in church, waiting for the bell to be rung, it's rung and we stand up and I realize that I'm not going to get to sing the great litany today and that there's going to be no procession of the great litany around the church. I, I wonder what you, and it's, again, it's early as, as Tim said, but I wonder what you think you'll miss the most yeah. about Anglicanism as you, as you go. Yeah, I mean, the, the musical tradition and hymnody as well, I mean, in the, in, within that, um, you know, Anglicans have a, a very good musical tradition, which, um, which I want the ordinariate still to use and, um, and the rest of the Catholic Church to use. Um, uh, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but at the ordination, we had all the great sort of hymns and even George Bell's. Um, Christ is the King. And the next day at my celebration of my first Mass, um, we also had great hymns. I mean, it was all saints tied, so it was good, you know, it was possible to have them. Um, yeah, the settings, the uh, Eucharistic settings, I mean, all of those things um, 
yeah, I do miss, but I hope we can continue using them. There's no reason why, why we shouldn't. Yeah, if the Commonwealth Daily Office is any proof, uh, Rome will steal the best stuff anybody has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's astonishing to me how good it is. And I'm like, yeah, this is the stuff I was praying for years, you know? That's right. And I mean, the reason is that the Anglican uh, offices are meant to be uh, used corporately. Whereas I think the Roman tradition has been very much of a, of a private um, devotion. And um, I think that is a strength and that is something we can bring to the, to the wider church. Uh, pivoting here just a, just a little bit, um, back to advice that we can give to folks who are sort of on the precipice, thinking about the, the church here, wondering if they can take the leap of faith, et cetera, et cetera. What would we say to people who are considering becoming Catholic, especially from the Anglican Episcopal tradition, but are trying to wrestle with the fact that they will be the only Catholic in their family, uh, the only Catholic amongst their friend group. Um, they might have to throw an entire professional network in the trash. Uh, so people who are seriously counting the cost, how might you encourage or counsel somebody in that space? Yeah, I think there is loss. I mean, there is you know, no question about that. There's sort of loss temperamentally, if you like. There is loss uh, in friends. There is loss of resources even. Uh, I don't think we can, we can deny that, but um, if this is God's will, then those resources will be made up. There will be new friends. Uh, and um, um, there will be new things to do. Um, so that it has to be a time of renewal as well. It's, um, uh, I've used the word fulfillment. I think renewal is probably a better word actually. Um, and I would urge them to, to consider all of those things. There is no reason, I mean, from our side, there should be no reason to break off relationships with people. I mean, sometimes other people will break them off and that's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. Uh, we continue to pray for them, uh, but wherever people want to keep friendships and um, relationships going, I, I don't think we should uh, in any way uh, turn away from that or distance ourselves um, from it. Um, so um, I've been asked to come to a number of um, sort of services, ecumenical services, Anglican services, uh, to bring a homily or something. I'm at a, a baptism this Saturday of a very well-known member of parliament's grandson I was down to do the baptism, <laughs> which I can't do now. Well, I mean, I can do it, but he wants an Anglican <laughs> baptism. Um, so yeah, that's fine. I, I got an Anglican friend to do it, but the MP then said, well, will you do the homily? So I said, yes, fine, I'm happy to, and I will uh, just consult. That is why I was consulting the Catholic Catechism <laughs> about uh, baptism. So, well, surely this constitutes an emergency situation and you can, you know, grab a bottle of water 10 minutes before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I will let the Anglican Bishop do I mean, the baptism administered by Christians, other Christians, it was uh, recognized by the Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if it had been some other thing, I might have had problems. But um, yeah. Um. So, well, yeah, speaking of beverages, falls water. Um, on <laughs> not, this, is, this is, sorry, I, I wasn't sure uh, whether I could ask this, but I think I can. Uh, so on uh, Talking Pints with Nigel, um, yeah. he definitely had a beer. I'm not sure, yeah. you either had like a Pilsner or something. It was a much lighter color. So I'm curious yeah, what you were sipping on. It was a lager. Oh, it was a lager, okay. But All right. I, I mean, it, it almost didn't look carbonated. I don't think it was. No, I think it was okay. a lager. Uh, maybe the carbonate lagers. I don't know. But <laughs> um, but uh, neither of us had more time than to have a few um, sips of it. 
you know, or whatever we had. So I don't know what happened to the rest. <laughs> uh, but it was the chair that was so uncomfortable. I, I don't think I'd agree to sit on a chair like that again. <laughs> oh man, I'll have to go rewatch it. Well, you you uh, you held up manfully under the circumstances. Oh well, no. well, thank you. Yes, I know Nigel. I mean, I've known him for a long time. Yeah. What uh, what poets are you reading lately? What poets? Sorry, did you say poets? Poets. <laughs> yeah, poets. Yeah. Well, uh, that's interesting. I've been reading um, some of Rowan's um, new poetry, actually. He just published a, a new book of poetry called Collected Poems uh, because he tries to emulate Dylan Thomas and some of the great sort of Welsh um, po poets and that tradition. Um, I, read, um, I read Persian poetry all the time. Um, I was doing a lecture in Oxford last week, and uh, that was uh, the great mystical, Sufi mystical poet Rumi um, that I was referring to quite a lot, but also some others. Um, and, he's, a, uh, he's, a dog, he's a dogmatic pillar in the mainline tradition here, Rumi. <laughs> well, no, I, well, you see, this is I've missed a boat on this one because in the 70s, uh, as a, because of my academic work, I had read every line of Rumi. Um, and um, if I had done some translations, then I might have made a fortune because, you know, <laughs> it's now, it's the power of positive thinking and Rumi are all over the place now. That's funny. Um, so uh, this is the... I think the last question that I have, Ryan, Ryan's probably got. I'll have I'll 10, have one more. more. I'll have one more um, for you, brother. Is uh, again on the on the theme you mentioned of of fulfillment rather than conversion. I get I guess I'm curious, like, what are you most looking forward to, whether in ministry or your other academic work? Uh, you know, what are you most looking forward to doing now? Um, yes. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, to some extent, it it doesn't depend on me. It depends on the authorities and what they ask me to do, and I still don't really know that. Uh, but as far as I am concerned, um, I, I've, um, I'm working on a manuscript on the mission of the Ecclesia Anglicana, uh, which I hope will be published. Uh, again, it's been one of these losses that the people who were publishing it have decided not to publish it. <laughs> Uh, but the Catholic press is interested, so um, I'm working, I'm trying to rework that to make it good for them. Um, the um, could you I, could you give us like the the elevator pitch for that? Uh, well, um, basically, it is um, it is about how. Um, uh, Ecclesia Anglicana, however you translate that, uh, was established. The mission of Augustine and all the issues that arose from that, but also the fact that it was a kind of pincer movement. So at the very time that Augustine was evangelizing from the Southeast, uh, the Celtic mission was evangelizing England from the North. Uh, and uh, they met from time to time. And of course, there was conflict and so on, as you know. Uh, and the matter was eventually settled in favor of the um, of the Roman mission. But uh, there's a lot to learn from both sides uh, for our own situation. So I'm something on that. Um, then something on the Reformation period and the the rendering of the of the Bible and the liturgy into the vernacular and its effect on. Uh, on people, um, the um, um, the way in which Anglicanism, as I was saying, has both a, uh, an impetus towards greater Catholicity and an impetus towards fragmentation uh, mm. needs to be explored. Um, and um, uh, I, I I had produced a kind of mission grid about from the Anglican 
experience or the Ecclesia Anglicana experience, however you want to put it, what is it that is essential for mission? Uh, and I've produced a kind of grid. Um, so, yeah, let's see how that works out. That's wonderful. Thank you. I have two more for you, Father, of grave importance. What is, uh, in your opinion, the best Pakistani food item? That's mm. question number one. And then question number two, what's your favorite papal encyclical? Well, let me answer the second one first. I think, um, well, there are two actually. Uh, uh, St. John Paul II's Redemptoris Missio was about the continuing missionary mandate of the church in which he discusses questions of mission and inculturation. Um, that I was asked actually to respond to it by the Vatican, which I did, a brief response, because they were collecting responses many years ago. The other act also actually by him is Utunum Sint, which is the ecumenical vocation of the papacy. I think that is very, very important uh, for us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That reading that just about converted me on the spot. It took a couple of years yeah. to work out what yeah. job I would do if I wasn't a priest, but that I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just try to read that one and not get misty eyed. I dare you. It's very yeah. important. Uh, He's and dodging then your the food question. He is, yeah. but you, we, we need, oh, to, know, food. We yeah, need yeah. to know Sorry, the best yeah. Pakistani yeah, dish. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, again, and this is a difficult question. I mean, not because I don't know what to say, but there are so many things to say. I think kebabs, um, there's a whole variety of kebabs. Actually, the ordinary, um, I uh, was at the governing council meeting um, recently, and they invited me to come with them uh, to a restaurant for a meal, and I discovered it was a Pakistani restaurant. I mean, I don't know how that happened, but I was very pleased that it did. But it was a restaurant that, uh, it was called Kababish, and it specialized in kebabs from northern, northwestern Pakistan. This is a kind of grilled, uh, grilled meats, or sometimes um, um, pan-fried um, meats of different kinds. Uh, the other thing, undoubtedly, the staple is biryani. Well, as a, as a Texan, I have a, a special devotion to grilled meats, so I'm sure I, oh, I'm sure I, could, <laughs> sure I could appreciate that. Well, don't let it become idolatry, the veneration. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for having this conversation with us Bless today. Um, we really look forward to passing it on to our readers here, and we're just so grateful for your time. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be watching you, and we'll be watching The Ordinary and praying for you all, and uh, you know, we wish you nothing but the best. Well, thank you. Thank you, and likewise for all of you. Yeah, thank you so much. Bless, Bless you. you.